this is less uh, this is less a kind of presentation from somebody standing in the podium and more an invitation to converse and dialogue um, I will present a lot I will plant uh, hopefully a lot of questions a few questions and uh, so that we can explore this particular theme as I set out to introduce uh, this new book um, so I'm going to do the, because this is my first time in India, and because I am an African, and because we are bound by the codes of hospitality, um, the first part is going to be uh, a rather elaborate, uh, uh, what should one call it, uh, a, a rather elaborate thank you. So here goes. OK. <laughs> OK, Madhubhumi. MBIFL 2019, the festival director and the entire team um, of this festival. And because I used to run a festival, I want to thank in a special way the technical team. Very few people ever thank you guys. Um, yet the festival moves and rides on your back. So thank you. And the amazing team of volunteers. If I could hug each one of you, I would. Um, my fellow writers. Publishers, other artists, ladies, and gentlemen. First, a good evening. And second, thank you for being here. Um, now, where shall we start with this? Uh, it's, okay, that's the book. Official launch date is March the 12th. So this is a special soft launch, or a special, let's say, introduction, simply because, quite frankly, simply because this is happening in Kerala. And Kerala does show up in this book. Um, eh, but it's the Kerala of my imagination, the Kerala of my dreams. Uh, it, I, did not ex I never expected to find myself here. So um, this is a very special moment for me as well. So this is a story of our seas. Um, and some of the questions I'm going to, I was going to plant in your minds is that sea we call the Indian Ocean. It has many other names, but we rarely ever think about those other names. Uh, to the Chinese, it's the Western Sea. To others, it's the Eastern Sea. Um, yes, it's accepted as the Indian Ocean. But in the old, on the old days, before the British came around and renamed the waters the Indian Ocean, it was also known as Ratnakara. Um, I want to call it the Swahili Seas because of where I come from. Uh, some of the Swahili call it the Ziwaku. So one of the questions as I was re researching this story was um, to ask around, what, was, what were the different names that were given to the sea? What was the Malayalam name for these particular seas? And I've asked that question before. And again, I run into the same thing I run into when I was doing this work in Zanzibar, uh, the surprise that for something so significant, the name might have been forgotten. And we will come back to that a little later, maybe during, the, our, during our conversation session. But these are the seas that bind us. Um, the story, this story starts with uh, uh, a, a letter that an incredible poet, a, late, a woman poet who was also the king's wife, um, from this invisible island where this story is located, wrote to her 14-year-old daughter uh, when, uh, when this woman was about, to, when she was aware that she was about to die. I put it up there for you because there are elements within this incredible piece of, uh, of, of, of poetry that was also a letter uh, that we'll find resonates also with this particular place. Um, apart from the fact that it's a most lyrical, structure, uh, a most lyrical verse, um, the things that bind us linked, were linked by uh, our shared history with the seas include things like coral and pearl and, and sprinkling perfume on the counterpanes, and jasmine, um, and, f and wearing feet anklets, okay, bracelets, rose water, and hina. But these are things that throughout the, throughout the times of our, I, I mean, throughout our contemporary centuries, we've, we've forgotten about, we've forgotten about the things that bind us. And this, by the way, is a very East African, and more precisely, a, 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 a Pate Island, um, a poem. But it would not be amiss in a place like Kerala uh, or in, you know, a, a, along some of the port cities of our Indian Ocean. 
Okay, what is this story? It's, it's, a, it's a coming of age story. A young woman called Ayana, and again to my surprise in Kerala, I ran into a girl called Ayana, uh, <laughs> um, who grows up in this island that sometimes doesn't even show up in anybody's maps, and uh, encounters aspects of history. This story actually, I was motivated um, uh, to explore this story, uh, a couple of inspirations. One was, we keep hearing a lot about China's return to, to Africa, um, and we're hearing only one type of story about the meaning of China's return to Africa. I was more interested in the, what I call the intimate histories. Uh, what, what do people who are within the spaces of this return actually uh, uh, feel about this return? And, and the island I chose was Pate Island, and there's a particular reason. You're going to meet him. Uh, this man. His final and last voyage. Uh, he's regarded, he, the, the great admiral, Zheng Ho, Xing He, others call him. But he, he when, when people speak of China's return, the, this man, this 600-year-old man, very much uh, features in, in the story. Every time uh, the Chinese infrastructure projects are established on the continent, in the African continent, uh, and I'm referring to places like Kenya, once it's complete, there's an image, an, an image or a statue of this man, this 600-year-old six, six, admiral, that, that, gets, um, uh, that gets installed. As if history has not ended, as if the, the kind of 600-year-old story has finally been able to complete itself. When I, when I was seeing all these things happening, I started to ask why. And I started to wonder why. And what is, what is it that we were not seeing or not understanding? Um, you, prob you guys probably know a lot more about this. Because by the way, this man, Admiral Zhong Ho, binds East Africa to Kerala. He's, he's the guy of all, this, all the amazing voyages across the world. But part of his stopover points included Cochin, Included, uh, uh, what are some of your port cities here? Exactly. He stopped right here on his way to um, all, all to the ports of East, Eastern Africa. And wherever he went, he did the same thing, extracted tribute. They were not necessarily interested in conquest. All they wanted, to, all they wanted was acknowledgement to say, OK, yes, you guys are the big guys of the Indian Ocean, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, yes, we will pay your tribute. We acknowledge that, yes, China is the central center of the universe. Just leave us alone. Because they would show up with, the, with, with, uh, with these ships, with 30,000 people on board, basically um, a, a moving army. So people would tend to, people, you know, people tended to um, respect the wishes that were demanded, right? Um, but... Uh, in, in interrogating, in, in exploring this, in, in looking at this guy um, uh, uh, and trying to understand what does his presence mean for the return of China to Eastern Africa, I was struck by a couple of things. Mostly that, um, certainly within the African space, we have not ever questioned, we haven't asked these questions. It's almost as if you're seeing and you're asking, the clue to this return lies in the uh, elevation of this man within the African continent. And I know in, in probably different places here, but what does it actually mean? And that, and that question was mostly missing. So in 2005, during the celebration of the 600th, voyage, the 600th anniversary voyage of this guy, Admiral Zhong Ho, in Kenya, a very interesting thing happened. A young girl called uh, Muamaka Sharifa, I hope she's there. A, a young girl from, from this obscure island. Okay, you see, these, 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 these are the lines of his voyage. And as you can see, each one of... Uh, he, in a way, the, the story of his life links, links us through our particular seas. There you are. Okay. Uh, you, you've heard the story of the, the, the giraffe that was taken from the East African coast and taken to the Forbidden City. This girl here, Muamaka Sharifa, Sharifu, um, from this obscure little island that have, has always said that during the, during the seventh voyage, something happened. This, and this was the final voyage of this great, great admiral we're talking about. Th he lost a third of his fleet in a, in a terrible storm that came up. 
and the assumption was that um, uh, most of the sailors died. But this little obscure island from which this little girl comes from had always said that uh, a, a large group of sailors survived and became part of the island, right? So, and, and now fast forward 600 years later, uh, 2005, a celebration in Nairobi, and uh, they say this girl from this island that we, even Kenyans don't know about, is, uh, they do DNA tests on her, they say yes, she is a descendant of the sailors, of the lost sailors from this uh, voyage, and she goes to China. She's sent to China as a kind of return, a conclusion of a 600-year-old story. Uh, which I, and I was so inspired by that and thought, okay, let me use that as a starting point of telling a story of another little girl. Um, it's not necessarily her story, but it's completely inspired um, by her. So what I'm going to do now um, let me introduce you to the little girl, Ayana. And uh, in this case, um, she, is, she was born illegitimate, and her search has been for a father. Um, and she decides that she's found one, uh, a sailor that has come, home, come back home after many years of uh, isolation and living, in, living on boats. Music amplified what they could not find in books. So in this, in this part of the story, she has imposed herself upon this man's life and has sought an education through him. Music amplified what they could not find in books. Ecumenical music lessons, Algerian Rai, Bangla, Kora, the symphonies of Golmareza, Minbashian, and Mehdi Hosseini, and every sample of Tarab they could get their hands on. No contemporary outpourings, which Muhyiddin told Ayana, were the residues of the disordered screechings of Iblisi. Thus, they roamed soundscapes. Hearing a melody, Ayana often cried out, what she sing, or read, while pressing clutched fists to her heart, where a stranger's musical yearnings throbbed. Mid-afternoon, one Tuesday, Muhyiddin reread to her the poetry of Hafiz, first in broken Farsi, followed by the his Kiswahili translation. O oh heart, if only once you experience the light of purity, like a laughing candle, you can abandon the life you live in your head. What it is saying, she asked, one day you'll know. Today, just listen. Lurking in Muhyiddin's home shop most of the day, Ayana also saw Muhyiddin dispense under-the-counter remedies to furtive people who whispered their needs through shuttered windows, pleading for help in love, hope, fecundity, peace, acceptance, mercy, exorcism, wealth, and health. Ayana told him, teach me. No. Yes, yes, yes. Watch me then, he sighed. Ayana watched Muhyiddin ease out the inner life of seed, fruit, root, bark, berry, crushed leaves, and crushed petals. She saw him blend anise, basil, chamomile, kisibiti, kalpasi, kurundu, pilipili manga, pilipili hoho, tangawizi, karfani, nunua, langilangi, lavani, kilua, karafu. Later she told him that her mother worked with flowers and water and oil, and that on their rooftop, tiny white night jasmine petals collected at night and drowned in distilled water. These were giving up their essence under the sun. She asked if he had ever eaten rose petals, and the next day she fed him four. He told her that the rose was a prophetess among flowers, that when flowers were created, the rose was sent to seduce humanity's heart for God. Then Muhyiddin showed Ayana how to replenish the drooping soul of herbs with a, ro with a drop of rose oil. So, um, that's, that's her first encounter with others. Anyway, but, but also linked to this particular story. Um, in the retelling of the Chinese presence in Africa, one of the things the Chinese are actually doing is also retracing their, re-excavating their old, deep African connections. Um, as an aside, that's part of the questions, is um, um, uh, quite frankly, I'm curious about uh, and, and this is part of our own conversation, um, would you know what the Indian 
government or academy is also doing about uh, um, uh, the issues of reconnection uh, with the Indian Ocean as we, with regard to the African continent. I'm just curious about that. Like I say, this is, this, is, this is the Chinese railway in Nairobi, but at every single point there is the picture uh, of, of, of the, the admiral. The admiral always shows up. This is the little island I'm talking about in, in which the source story is located. Most of the times you do not find it on the map at all. But yet it is a very important and vital place. There's Ayana, uh, well, there's Mwamaka again. Um, this is what the island looks like, and I, I imagine it wouldn't be too different from some of the, the, play, the spaces right here. Uh, the cloth they're wearing is the same kind of fabric that I'm wearing. In the history of this cloth, uh, the, the cloth would actually be made here, uh, would be made in India, and then put on a ship, put on a dhow, and, and, and then uh, distributed in Eastern Africa. But there was this kind of exchange. Some of the, some of the cloth makers actually had uh, bases and centers in uh, Zanzibar, in Mombasa, in Malindi. Uh, it's called a leso or a kanga. Um, this is the island that, uh, around which the story is located. But more importantly, um, these are the, the, of course, they, I mean, the, uh, this kind of labyrinthine streets are very common in, uh, on, in, in some of the homes along our Indian Ocean. Again, these are, these are images that you would also particularly recognize coming from this part of the world. And again, and, and, and let me go back to the other question. In the centuries, in the, in the, in, uh, well, in, in, and it's a short century of our separation and, and disconnection, again, I'm curious about the lack of curiosity about our shared past, okay? And the fact that a different um, imaginations and different ideas about who we are have imposed themselves and created a separation that was not actually real. Okay, uh, I think this, this is also important, uh, the doors. These, these doors are also um, a feature of the different places uh, along the East African coast. But these doors used to be built by uh, Gujarati craftsmen who would, who would travel on boats to actually construct uh, these particular doors that you still find on the island to this day. Um, and you had uh, builders' guiles that were established right there, that, and, and there's been a, a kind of continuity of the, of the particular art, okay? Some of the other details. Uh, this was one of my interlocutors. He's a minstrel, he was a ship, o ship owner, he was a sailor, he was a Dao captain. He was his Tanzania's poet laureate, Haji Gora Haji who actually introduced me, reintroduced me to the sea. Uh, ah, yes, and why dragonfly? Um, every year at the beginning of the, the southwest monsoon, actually in, in the in-between season, just before October reaches, dragonflies leave northern India to traverse the Indian Ocean and it's actually the fourth generation of these dragonflies that land in the coast of Kenya in October. And they arrive with also migrating birds, but they also arrive, and they're associated with the arrival of rain. They, when they land on the East African coast, uh, then, the, then, the, then, the, then the short rains also start. So there's a kind of auspicious uh, connection with the arrival of dragonflies. And it's a, it's a bit of a, and uh, to my surprise, to discover that it is a bit of a thing. Um, and uh, f looking at the work of the, this man, Chris Anderson, who has traced the, it's probably the longest migration of insects um, in the world, it, longer than even that of the monarch butterflies. Okay, okay um, again, just very quickly, um, the easy connections. On the left, of course, is the, uh, is the Indian version of samosa. Um, uh, no, yes, on the left is the Indian version of samosa. For the first time I tasted what samosa was supposed to taste like here, uh, on, on the right is the mess we have made of the Kenyan of the samosa, and uh, for that I apologize in advance. But uh, again, if you arrive, one of the things you're going to laugh about is when you come to Eastern Africa, you'll find that East Africans claim the samosa as theirs, <laughs> you know, and this is their, you know. But again, in a way, you, you cannot say it's not because, again, of the history of belonging, of exchange, of, uh, of owning, um, and it's... Uh, like one of the Nairobi people boldly told somebody, the samosa is as Kenyan as the Kenyan flag. <laughs> um, biryani. 
again, the Indian version, the Swahili version of biryani. Um, again, I must apologize for what we've done to the chapati. Uh, but then it's also, it's also regarded as Kenyan. Um, and of course, masala, masala tea, which we also call chai. So when we talk about these connections and interactions, um, they are tangible, they are real, they, are, uh, they traverse, transcend history, and they tra transcend time and space. Okay, uh, the, the Admiral again. So let me read also to you from um, Uh, the, the, the Kerala girl, the, let me introduce you to the Kerala girl in the story. And remember I wrote her with, without knowing that I was going to come here. The first thing that people noticed about Delaksha Tarangini Sudamsu was the broken trapeze-shaped plum-colored wine stain beneath her left ear. Today, they would also see a blood-streaked bandaged hand. This five foot five woman whose black fluffy hair with five gray streaks now hang, now hang as limp strands around her face wore oversized dark brown sunglasses that were two hues darker than her blotchy skin. They covered the blue red of a healing right eye shutting bruise. Rubenesque was how she described her figure on her good days. Twice she had turned around but then returned. As she approached the harbor master's office, she straightened up, tightened her lips, and burst through the door. Her clipped English had a lacrimose quality to it that complemented her overly bright, brittle smile. Good afternoon. My name is Miss Deluxe Taranjini. Words failed her. She tried again. I I'm trying not to cry, she explained to the suddenly nervous man at the desk. I was reading a book a few days ago, a South American author, well, he has his character enter a tavern and go up to a tavern keeper and request a solic solicitude de asilo, lovely word, solicitude. It evokes protectiveness, so may I bother you and make a request for shelter? In her mind's eye, a vision of a simple white sheeted bed, a breeze blowing through wide windows, voices on the street. She added, I need to go home to my mother. She opened a pouch and showed two passports. Which one, I beg you, which one will take me back to Kerala? The man, bombarded by sound, color, and words he had never heard strung together like that, cleared his throat before speaking in the be reasonable, long-suffering manner of old Kenyan bureaucrats. Now, madam, now, madam, listen, listen, madam. There are procedures we must follow. The rules are... She wilted before him and blubbered. Her tears made the call run down her face, streaking it black. Please, please. The de desperate, the man shuffled papers. Emotion was not his forte. What can I do? See, madam, Kerala? Where was Kerala? Teasing straws, madam, if you have, do you have 50,000 shillings for a cabin in a cargo ship? China, from China, maybe you can, uh, Kerala? The lecture dug into her handbag and drew out all the Kenyan shillings she carried, even the coins. The man counted 74,000 shillings. She, she said, if there was more, I'd give it to you. Take it all. The stupefied man watched her carefully. She had materialized from nothing. She shifted shape. She leaked. She flowed in multiple directions with unexpected consequences for him. He looked at his tabletop, studying his big pen. He would fill in the form for her. It would make her go away quickly. Your hand, madam, he muttered, is bleeding. She said, yes, I had an epiphany. It was better for him, the man realized too late, not to speak. Delaksha was frowning at her bandaged hand. Conscious bit me, she told the man. He's a Doberman Alsatian. The man worked extra carefully on Delaksha's form. The dog pities me, she told the man. It was good news, the man understood, that this woman was leaving Kenya. Kerala, he 
he asked. You will be happy there. Thank you for saying that. I could kiss you. Please, no, madam, he froze, not daring to move lest it encourage her. Please. He was firm about that. When Delaksha left, he made himself a cup of hot tea. Okay, and then remember, I was telling about the name, naming of the ocean, right? So I'll do a little, I'll do the last part. I'll do um, Ayana is in class in China. And they're learning about the sea. Ayana shrank into her seat, focusing on the sound of the slogan. Oh, no. Um, a shuffle of papers, a different image on the projector. The lecture on sea routes was proceeding with another elaboration of the one belt, one road. They were reviewing the five principles of peaceful coexistence. Suddenly, the lecturer called out Ayana's name. Badawi, Xiao Ji. Ayana jumped as the lecturer gestured. Shared future destiny, yes? The class turned to gaze at Ayana. Ayana shrank into her seat, focusing on the sound of the slogans. Honor in trade, prosperity for all. The lecturer continued, Our Western Ocean is our gateway to mutual greatness. In the retelling of the life of her sea, Ayana saw that the Maritime Silk Road Initiative had gobbled, in, gobbled up Pate's place in the global monsoon complex. By her very presence, Ayana felt implicated, as if she were betraying her soul. She sank into her seat, also overwhelmed by this infinite land of infinite armies and infinite words and the machinery that as a signal could roll over skies, waters and earth to reach her home and cause it to disappear. She had come to school wanting to enter into the language of the seas through a people she was to imagine were her own. Instead, she was learning how the world was reshaping itself and her sea with words that only meant energy, communications, infrastructure, and transportation. Storm warning. Neither Pate nor the Kenya she had rarely thought about had acquired a vast enough imagination to engulf the cosmos that was writing itself into their center. Ayana suppressed a sigh and eavesdropped on the snipings of other foreign students who had resorted to petty territorial snipings that changed nothing. Her thoughts were in turmoil. One hot and humid day, Ari, a student of marine engineering from India, observed that the Maritime Silk Road Initiative seeded the Indian Ocean. He had emphasized Indian to the others. It is not for nothing that the ocean is called Indian, he noted. Ayana retorted, Ziwaku. Ari turned to her, Oogle Boogle? Ziwaku, Ayana refused to cede territory. Ari said, We'll discuss that with your good self the day your country acquires a motor vote to start a navy. Ayana said, Ziwaku, and we have a navy. Doubtless, its fish boundaries are commandable, but what else? Titters. Ratnakara, said an Indonesian. Indian Ocean, emphasized Ari. Ziwaku, repeated Ayana. Indian Ocean. Two Pakistani students chimed in. Ziwaku. The class slipped into an uproar that did not change Chinese foreign policy. The lecturer who had watched the disintegration of order in his class in disbelief, his face becoming blotchy, at last screamed, The Western Ocean! You are in China! Western Ocean, murmured Ayana, looking at Ari from beneath her fringe as she doodled the word Ziwaku on her notepad, thinking about a kipate toponym. Her heart pleased about the skirmish she had stirred. The lecturer was shouting out his points. Ayana returned to jotting down notes of other nations' imagination for her sea. One belt, one road, she wrote. She would have to ask Muhyiddin what the different Kipata names for her sea were. Okay. I think this is a good place to stop, and let's talk. Storytellers should have a vision or perception. My question is this. How do you select characters in your stories? Okay, a very good question. Are you an, are you an aspiring writer? Um, are you? How do you select characters in your stories? I, I'll tell you, but are, are you also a writer? Are you trying to write? 
I'm asking you if you are an aspiring writer yourself. Yes. Okay, then let me tell you how to select characters in a story. Um, um, actually, characters, of, you can say it. Character, character, what's your name? Taishi. Uh, characters are most, I think characters are the most important part of a story. There are other writers who say, they put things differently. Because my own search is always for um, the idea of the human being in whatever form it takes. Even if, you, even if you turn a chair into a character, at the heart of it is the question of, uh, uh, because, because we're human beings, even if you write a chair as a character and make the, give the chair a voice, um, ultimately you're projecting the whole question around your own humanity. How do you create characters in a story? From everything around you, okay? You pay attention to people, watch people very carefully. Sometimes I go into places I shouldn't go to and just sit as if I'm a part of them, just to eavesdrop on their conversations, right? Writers tend to be shameless that way, right? Because sometimes you need to hear their special voice. Uh, sometimes I struggle when I'm writing a new story. I, I can't really begin a story until I can hear the characters speak to me, right? Um, so um, it's just, just use, your, use your eyes, use your attention, listen to people around you. Um, a, a lot of imagination. Um, the teacher you dislike, uh, you, you, as, as, a, as a young writer, you don't need to get angry with the teacher. Um, you, you, don't get, you, you, you don't get angry, get even. So you turn, you, that's where you create your, character, your villains. Yeah? Your villains give them your teacher, the, 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 the people that you dislike, their voices and things like that. Right? Where do you get characters from a story? From everybody around you and from everything around you, right? Okay. Does that answer your question? Good, yeah.